Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Lopes on Movies. My name is Joey Lopes, and today I am joined by Connor. Hey, Joey. And Mark. Hello. How you guys doing? Oh, you know, just uh, keep it on, keep it on, or however they would you say that stupid line. <laughs> well, something like that. How about you, Mark? What have, what have you been up to these days? Doing okay. Um, mostly cooking and working because that's all you can really do when you're locked up inside for this long. I guess I've watched some movies too. Yeah, but that's about yeah. it. Yeah, I feel like we're uh, we're kind of. We've been spreading our lockdown bits really thin over the yeah. past couple of weeks. Like, pretty much every single one of these episodes, I've segued from our opening into, but you know, one thing we can do is yeah. watch movies. So, I, I don't want to do that again. Yeah, you know, yeah. One, one thing that I'm doing uh, starting now is yeah. uh, I'm watching Korean baseball. Oh. Yeah. Is that still on? <laughs> no, it's, it just started. It just started, uh, uh, like, uh, this week. Oh, so, wow. Oh, well, that sounds cool. Yeah. I mean, you can't watch American baseball, so... No, because that's watch, not a thing. Gotta watch yet. something. Yeah, so it, it, it's hopefully gonna fill the void, you know. We'll see. <laughs> well, you know what can fill the void? <laughs> we just Movies. said we wouldn't do this. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I lied. Um, the one important thing that we have this week that we haven't had in the past couple of weeks is a little bit of movie news. I think yeah. it's uh, it's been a little while since we've we've talked about movie news, mostly because there hasn't been a lot of movie news because of, you know, the lockdown and everything being closed. But as we predicted a couple of episodes ago, uh, this lockdown situation is potentially having a serious ripple effect on the industry. So the, the big news of the past week, week and a half or so, is that AMC Theaters has announced that when they reopen, they will no longer be showing any films from the studio NBC Universal because... Well, let's start at the beginning. So, mm -hmm. due to the closure of theaters, right, NBC Universal decided to test the waters of releasing their first run films on video on demand. And they started with their animated family film, Trolls World Tour, which I'm sure all of us were super excited to watch as soon as it was available. Uh, well, yeah. apparently there yeah. were because it, you know, <laughs> well, next part. Well, I mean, all the I, kids I, are stuck at home. What are they going to do? You got your, like, screaming little kids running around. <laughs> you put on Trolls World, World Tour on loop. Yeah, so you can have yeah. another, like, cocktail in the corner on your yeah. own so you can just get through the <laughs> day. And you cause the death of the movie industry. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. So, before we get ahead of ourselves, boys, um, <laughs> the... Uh, we, we mentioned this as a possibility a couple of weeks ago and how they there's a couple of other things like uh universal also ha i believe had the uh invisible man and the hunt also came out on video on demand so they're the first like major studio that has been really been trying this um but the trolls world world tour was the first one that didn't get any like theatrical release at all and mm -hmm. they just decided they're going to release it on video on demand so apparently it was a pretty big success, an unexpected success, as they said. And the CEO of NBC Universal, Jeff Schell, went as far as to say that they expect to release films in theaters and on demand even when theaters reopen. So they are just going to decide to potentially not even do anything about the theatrical window anymore. They're just going to do everything same day. Um, so that last proclamation is likely uh, the straw that broke the camel's back for mm -hmm. AMC theaters who released mm -hmm. a statement that they would no longer play any of the films from Universal when they reopen. And AMC's CEO, Adam Aaron, said that they would cut ties with any studio that was contemplating a wholesale change to the status quo. So th th there's there's trouble in paradise, guys. Yeah, he threw down the gauntlet yeah, in his yeah. open letter. He was yeah. like, no, you're not doing this. And anybody yeah. who does, you're not going here either. Everybody's shut down. We're... It, it, it kind of feels like they're shooting themselves in the foot more than anything, but it's, yeah. what are they going to do? Like, these are, like, they make most of their money off of the, the snacks, really. It's not about the tickets bringing things money-wise, but you can't get anybody in your theater to eat your popcorn. Right. You need a movie for them to go see. Right. And, and one of the major uh, studios saying that they're, you know, going to do this and th then AMC saying we're not going to show any of your, of your movies. Mm -hmm. That's it, it's an interesting thing because yeah, it, it kind of I mean, hurts them yeah. both, you know, yeah. but it, the question is, who does it hurt more? And I think that's ultimately what we have to what we have to figure out. I mean, my money is on the theaters losing out on this overall. Oh, yeah. But I think that like 
it, it, it depends, right? Because if the the choice to release films on video on demand same day balances out the loss of revenue from not having your movie playing in one of the largest theater chains in the country, then it's worth it. But I, I, I don't know. I feel like they're going to have to come to some sort of consensus. Either that or, or Universal is just, you know, they're going rogue and they don't care. Yeah, I guess yeah, this is I, kind of stating... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, like, the interesting interesting thing. Like, you have to choose, I guess, when something like this happens. And AMC has always been a little bit more brash than other places. Like, remember when the movie, mm-hmm. movie Pass came out? They immediately mm-hmm. were, like, st- extremely opposed, even yeah. before the mm-hmm. others, like, uh, theater chains. And we can get into Regal's response also, because, obviously, if a huge chain like AMC comes out this hard, you gotta want, want to know what another one's gonna say. And mm-hmm. theirs is a little bit different, but at the mm-hmm. same time... It all comes down to this, this so this status quo ninety month theatrical window. Mm-hmm. Ninety day what, yeah. or ninety day, sorry, ninety, <laughs> 90 day, month. Th- ninety month, Jesus, ninety day <laughs> theatrical window. That's the Disney. They they would love the ninety window. ninety year or ninety year <laughs> theatrical window. It never comes out, but uh, it's that ninety day thing. Like, where mm-hmm. did that? Is that just like what they've always done? Like, and. Well, they I had to come up with like some a, sort yeah. of uh, some sort of thing when home video became a an, an issue for theater chains, and I think they came to some sort of agreement um, back, you know, a long time ago that now is starting to get interrupted. Right, mm-hmm. but clearly it was an agreement, like not like a oh, yeah. contract, like it was, you know, an agreement or like a, and, and you know, we're gonna do in this. In the past, like it's been broken before when movies bomb, just totally bomb, and they're out of theaters within a month, then it's kind of a little more lax but Mm -hmm. to have it be more unilateral is just a no-go but in a way it's kind of the theater admitting that they have nothing to offer except for the exclusivity of a new movie it's it's (laughs) kind of sad (laughs) yeah in a way that's kind of the uh the unwritten unwritten thing there i mean like universal said oh you know we're committed to a theatrical experience and everything but i think the uh the, the writing on the walls of the theatrical experience these days is isn't isn't very good mm. in the uh, in the big chains at least. So I think the uh, the lack of exclusivity could be a disaster for for any of these theaters. So I don't know. I, I really don't know who's going to come out on top here. I mean, like I said, I I would think that the the studios definitely have more leverage than the theaters, but I don't know. It's it's an interesting time. I guess we'll see what happens. You know, whenever lockdown is is over, when you know, whenever that's going to be. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and just to for context, Regal's response was, "It they're not going to just make a a full stop on no Universal films are not allowed to be played here." But they did say that they will continue to show films that respect that ninety day window. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, what is it going to be a pick and choose kind of thing like what does that mean they're essentially saying the same thing but not as like harshly and they're not going to just say immediately nothing is allowed but it's going to be interesting too because the directors clearly want their stuff in uh, like to be seen on a theater so absolutely it's meant for that but do they have enough clout to like still make sure the theater experience is a thing like I don't like think so I, I, I can't they have do they have anything but like no. some of these bigger guys like could you imagine Christopher Nolan has a movie that's going to be that's supposed to be coming out this year that I guarantee he's not thrilled with the chance that it, his how is his movie going to get seen in theaters mm-hmm. given everything that's happening this year and then depending on what's going to happen to theaters in the future mm-hmm. I have to imagine directors are not going to take too well to the the possible collapse of this theater industry yeah yeah i mean i guess another like underlying question is how would theaters even compete with the home experience nowadays now that's what we're talking about like is there a way if this just becomes a thing for theaters to even compete i can't think of a single thing that theaters could do that they're not already doing uh, except for just stricter rules or just do more more quality control because really the things that the theaters have done to try to improve the theatrical experience i feel like it's it's already kind of hit the max like we have reclining chairs we -hmm. have like dinner we have alcohol available like they're they're doing everything to get people into the theaters the thing that's not working is that often the experience isn't very good 
like the incorrect you know projection of the films um the things that could be blurry like the, the lens is out of focus people uh, people talking. people talking on their phones people you know lighting up the, the whole theater with their their cell phones and then people not doing anything about it like there's no bringing enforcement a baby of any into rules. the theater yeah, bringing a baby great. into the theater yeah. i mean like like <laughs> the, i would say the vast majority and i've said this all the time of, of uh of theater experiences i've had in the past like years have been compromised in some ridiculous way yeah and it's not like people can't react obviously but if you're sitting there on your phone it's like a giant flashlight in the theater it's a tremendous distraction right but mm -hmm. and I, I don't know so i i really don't know what theaters can do other than exclusivity to to make the things better unless they start thing... really enforcing the rules yeah i mean aside from actually making the theater experience what they've advertised this is an odd thing to say, maybe, but it would be kind of cool, and, and I, I think some areas do this, but to see more old movies that have gone, played mm. many, many years ago, getting to see those on a theater screen, it's kind of it's kind of nice. Like That could yeah. be something, but the problem is there's no sustainability with that. Yeah. You're not going mean, to get the young people. I mean, it depends on the movie, to... but the yeah. thing I'm worried about with all of this more than anything is because I don't really care if the theaters go away or not. Because the the experience, I, I'd rather see a movie on a theater screen, but the experience being so awful a lot of the time kind of is worse than the fact that I have to not see it that way. It's 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 a weird situation. But what I'm worried about is that the money is just going to go away from movies eventually. Yeah as a mm -hmm. long-term effect and it's going to go more towards tv and or just the television style and just it's going to really like hurt the the art form i think it very so, well could it very well yeah. could which is that's, uh, that's the is, worry you know that's a, that's a downer way to end this uh this segment <laughs> okay all right, but, all right. Uh, well i got i got a better way to, to I, I got another <laughs> thing we should talk about oh do you connor yeah yeah, yeah. so, so there's more movie news so as uh as everybody knows, this was a big, big week in a certain fandom's community. We're not talking about Star Wars. No, All right, everybody. Oh, no, so, no, 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 we, we are. We are. We, I, like, I we, like we predicted. The, yeah. <laughs> also, what's his name? Taika Waititi has been been given the role he was to. Tapped. He was he was tapped on the shoulder. Taika, you're our guy. And how? When? What better day to announce that Taika Waititi will direct and co-write the new Star Wars feature film? Then on May the fourth. Wow, Star what Wars What a likable guy. Yeah. All well, everybody, that was interesting news. <laughs> now we're going to talk about something else on, uh, on on this show because you know why talk about things that suck when you can talk about <laughs> things that are great. <laughs> so everybody, transition. we uh, we actually did watch a movie um, for for this episode. It's another another one of our Lopes on movie classics, we could say. Um, but a slightly more recent one. We've been kind of delving into the, the history of, of film a lot with our, our previous episodes over the past couple of weeks. But this one is from the late 90s that we watched. And it is the f second film from, of course, the very well-known director Wes Anderson called Rushmore. So... Oh, man. Who, 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 should, who should do the, uh, the synopsis for this one? I can read it. Sure, Mark, go for it. Cool. Rushmore is the story of an eccentric teenager mate named Max Fisher, his wealthy industrialist friend, Herman Bloom, and the first grade teacher they both fall for, Rosemary Cross. It was directed by Wes Anderson in 1998 and stars Jason Schwartzman, Bill Murray, and Olivia Williams. And I guess, Connor, would you like to talk a little bit? How did you feel about Rushmore? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think I picked out uh, I, I get threw out a few yes. ideas of, of people that we could, uh, you know, di different directors and then certain movies. And I haven't seen Rushmore. But I, I'm very familiar with Wes Anderson, but uh, I thought it would be a, a good fit to go to 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 him him next. And uh, yeah, this is this is obviously great. Like he's got like this is kind of before he he like developed that like that style, like mm -hmm. the super it style. Have like, his all in sort of right it's still there later movies. but it's yeah. not like it's not so dialed in and it, yeah. it's, it's really good and i i think it's kind of nice to actually see it like scaled back a little bit but you could see where he would he'd be going but mm -hmm. you know it's just a it's an extremely nice story and mm -hmm. i think it's also really cool that uh 
this is I guess this is part of Bill Murray's like I'm going to just do independent movies phase cuz mm-hmm. he he started doing a lot of these and I think this is definitely the first one he was in with with Wes Anderson, right? And I he's guess so it's, good it's, in he, it too. He, yeah. He's fantastic, but like I guess around this time he did like he did Lost in Translation. Like I mean maybe he just like got involved in this in, this independent scene and like he just gave, gives these fantastic performances. I love what Wes Anderson does with with uh with young actors too and oh, like yeah. just just like over uh they, they, they kind of over intellectualizes them a lot of the time and it's like fun to see them interact with like adults yeah. as equals <laughs> which is like so fun and this one is like yeah. a great example of that uh yeah i mean we can go into all sorts well, of ways but maybe even go into wes anderson a bit before you we bring delve up, in. oh yeah okay the the interesting thing that you brought up with the 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 ages in this movie are so disparate and all of them interact like their peers it's very yeah. Right, that's that's a that's a cool style that he's able to do. He does that with. There's other things that he's done that in his uh, his different films too. Uh, Joey, how about uh, you yeah. give us a little uh, little breakdown on on Wes Anderson, maybe? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Let's let's uh, let's do it. So uh, obviously, Wes Anderson is very very well known these days. He's one of the most well known independent film directors of of our time, I think. Um, and as you mentioned, Connor, he's very well known for his his very like storybook kind of fairy tale approach to to his his films and not just in like the writing and storytelling but really in their production design mm-hmm. i think like typically if you see a wes anderson movie you're going to see something very like lavish and unusual um very 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 highly stylized um and if you've seen like some of his more recent movies like you know grand budapest hotel or moonrise kingdom um, i think his most recent movie was isle of dogs which was like a stop motion oh film. yeah that one is um, probably the most wes anderson <laughs> wes anderson film yeah, it's it's gotten to a point where his it's it's almost like a joke, like it's a Wes Anderson-y it, you know movie, right? Because mm-hmm. his style is so distinct and so obviously his. Um, but before all of that, before he was you know the the Wes Anderson we we know today, he was just a student at the University of Texas at Austin, where he met Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson. Actually, they they came up in the industry together. Oh, wow. And yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, nice. um, anyway, so yeah. So originally, Wes Anderson and Owen Wilson collaborated on a lot of the the film projects that they were doing. So the first like feature that they wrote together was a movie called Bottle Rocket, which wasn't like a tremendous success when it came out, but it was it was seen by the right people and it was very critically loved. I, I think like Martin Scorsese said it was like one of his favorite movies of the '90s. Um, so just on the successes of that movie, he was able to get um, his second movie, Rushmore, made, which was also co-written with Owen Wilson. Um, and Rushmore, again, was not a huge financial success, but it was you know beloved critically and now has a pretty huge cult following. Um, and uh, Martin Scorsese, of course, is, was a big fan. He had this to say after seeing it. He said, uh, Wes Anderson, he knows how to convey the simple joys and interactions between people so well and with such richness. This kind of sensibility is rare in movies. And I, I definitely, you, you, you can feel that in, in every single one of Wes Anderson's movies. But uh, more to the point of Rushmore, I, I agree that, like, because this is only Wes Anderson's second movie, it, it was before he really crystallized that style that he would be super well known for. Yeah. And I think there's 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 pros and cons to that. Like, for me, Rushmore is it's, it's probably one of my favorite movies ever. Like, I, I love this movie, and it's probably my favorite Wes Anderson movie. And I think the thing that makes it resonate with me more so than some of his more recent movies, which I still love, but I think it's the, the cool style that he developed is a little bit more like emotionally distant than what he did in Rushmore, which is like heightened, but feels kind of, it's almost like it's heightened in a nostalgic way. It's not really artificial. Like you, you, you it feels grounded in some kind of reality, even if it is kind of a heightened reality, which is different from his, his later films, which ask a lot of you in your suspension of disbelief for just kind of buying yeah, into the, the style of the of um, the the staging they feel yeah. like stage plays which is yes a funny thing to say about this movie yes definitely and and definitely like rushmore has some some elements like that but it still feels a little bit more grounded and for that reason i think the the characters and their dynamics come through a little bit more like in, in a more pronounced way because you're not like slightly distracted by the production it's mm-hmm. a, you can kind of just dial into into the emotions that the movie kind of kind of communicates, and man, it's just the, the the characters are just so wonderful, and the the dynamics between them are are so interesting. Like you guys said, like how the characters all behave like they're equals. I I I love how every character in the movie 
like uh, everything is taken so seriously you know especially mm-hmm. between like the younger kids yeah it's like they're, they're in this like th- this particular world that they are 100 percent like bought into and their friendships mean something and like everything is like so intense in their relationships and uh it's it's just a, a really fascinating thing but obviously i think the most important dynamic in the movie is between max and uh and herman played by bill murray just because I, I actually like that you guys the point that you were making where all the characters are act like equals that was like i think one of the things that they wanted to do with this movie with those two characters they, they thought it was an interesting dynamic to have you know a 15 year old kid be like an equal with this like rich best friends you with know, a best friends with, with like a CEO millionaire guy. like yeah yeah yeah, it's, right. it's, 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 it's fascinating. It's, and it's they have a really good rapport, too. Like, you don't, you buy it. It doesn't feel yeah. awkward in the movie. It's just like this lonely guy with a failing marriage and this weirdo kid who's really ambitious. So you feel like, okay, yeah, I, yeah. I like it. Yeah, it's and, like they're they're at the same place emotionally, but for different reasons, right? Yeah. Like, because like, Max is, is obviously a super eccentric teenager, right like his 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 whole bit is that he's like super involved in school and like does a million clubs and just loves the school and loves everything about it but he's like flunking mm-hmm. all of his classes and is a pathological focus. liar and it's like a liar he's he's just like a dumb kid right yeah and whereas herman is like he's rich but his life did not go the way that he envisioned that it would there's a great line where he's like watching his like meathead sons wrestling Mm-hmm. And he, he just says to Max, which is hilarious to me, he says to Max, <laughs> never in a million years did I ever imagine I'd have kids like this, <laughs> which uh, I think is actually something that Owen Wilson's father said to him or, oh, or said about him. So that's that. <laughs> it, this comes from a very real place. But uh, it's just such an interesting like character dynamic to have those two kind of meet at, meet at the middle, which absolutely works. And then there's a love triangle. The movie centers around a love triangle between yeah. the three, but it's not played. Hmm. It doesn't feel cynical, I guess. It feels pretty pure. Oh and yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, and even um, though Max like is, I, I feel like Max alternates between being really lovable and being just like really like cringy and a hard little creep. to yeah, like like a little creep. But at the same time, it's like in in a endearing way, and like you, you kind of understand his mindset and you you root for him. Even and you though give he him like a break because he's a yeah. kid. Yeah, exactly. And like he, I think like the ultimately this is a like a coming of age movie, and I think the, mm-hmm. the his infatuation with this, this teacher Rosemary Cross and uh, him falling in love with her, like I think that that relationship is really the foundation of the movie's coming of age and kind of him getting past this like adolescent fantasy he has where he you know obviously is in love with somebody who's like you know twenty years older than him and it would never ever possibly happen, but he's like. He, he can't see that because he's he's he, he's blinded by by his feelings for her, but him coming to terms with the reality of uh of what the situation actually is and what her care what her character actually who she is you know and what what she actually like represents is a large part of that coming of age and there's just really some like it, th- that character relationship is just as interesting as the one between him and herman just because of mm-hmm. how it alternates between like being very tender and loving but also sometimes being like very very like painful and awkward and he has a lot of growing up to do yep i think there's a really strong sense of like and and you kind of getting at it but there's like a strong sense of like a nostalgic melancholy and that carries forward Mm -hmm. through a ton of wes anderson's movies oh yeah i think it's almost the the predominant feeling in almost all of them especially grand budapest hotel oh yeah this one um the there's the the arc of it i love that this movie isn't afraid to drive the characters forward and have them face consequences for their actions Mm -hmm. things like like the max gets kicked out of rushmore like (laughs) in the first act of the movie yeah and it kind of only plays a bit part going from that point forward but it's like a symbol of their um desire to make something of themselves i think Mm -hmm. and and do something with their lives but it's their way too yeah it's it's separate from them like it's taken from them it's not it's not what they imagine it to be Mm -hmm. and i i don't know i just love 
the the overall arc and and how the, like all these little touches like max almost immediately gets a couple of lackeys and he goes to his new school yeah. <laughs> um, and, and he's like he didn't change and and you you're almost worried for a moment that he's going to to face reality at that point and become like you know a laughing stock because he's a weirdo but no he just keeps on trucking he's like yeah. he's the guy and it's great yeah, and, like and, even, even though he's he, th there's a lot of learning he has to do. Mm -hmm. He e even even Herman sees it immediately. He's like, you know, you seem to have it all figured out, Max. <laughs> in, in a sense, in a sense, he does. In, in right. a weird Both way. Both of them kind of do, but they yeah. they have that part that's missing of them. From uh, basically the relationship with Rosemary mm -hmm. shows that, and and even though for all intents and purposes they're incredibly successful people, incredibly ambitious, and and just like really impressive they still aren't happy with themselves and that's mm -hmm. i think the core of the the but it's not like they're 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 being um jerks about it they're not being all like entitled it's more along the lines of i have all of this but what am i kind of mm -hmm. the overall feeling i get from from rushmore is that you can see because i think i've seen almost all of wes anderson's movies at this point Mm -hmm. You can see where it goes from here, and it's dialed back, and it's not it's not so different as to be like, whoa, he made this movie so like something like Jackie Brown is to to Quentin Tarantino mm -hmm. um more along the lines of I think that it's not like a proof of concept so much as a it it's it's just this the it's just kind of a beautiful thing unto itself. Yeah, absolutely. I I think the, the the core of Rushmore for me is that it's just a, a wonderful, lovely, emotional experience with just truly incredible, well well drawn characters. It's just a it's a movie that's just incredibly funny and moving. Mm -hmm. And I, I really feel like I, I like how you said it's not just like a proof of concept for his style. It, it is like a fully actualized thing in and of itself. Like in some ways, I think his first movie, Bottle Rocket, does feel a little bit like kind of like testing the waters. But to mm -hmm. me, Rushmore is like a perfectly formed thought. Like I, I couldn't imagine anything that could be changed in Rushmore to be to make it better or worse. It's it's this absolutely wonderful piece of work. So I highly recommend that anybody check out this movie. Um, and of course, uh, just one one last point: if you like. You know, British Invasion rock and roll. You will, yes. uh, you, you will like Rushmore a lot. The soundtrack uh, is just covered in it. Yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, there's something so warm and nostalgic about about that music. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that's just because I love that music growing he up. He does it a lot better than many other filmmakers did. He does now, or do. <laughs> what you mentioned there is this is a wonderful movie, and it's not a knock against it. But you can see where Wes Anderson completely just like got pulled up there like picked up by a ton of tiny indie movies later on oh down yeah the line. yeah that and that's kind of what i meant more that like the these indie movies that are less you know artistic just kind of mm -hmm. throw those songs in to kind of create the feeling that his movies have already you know like they the, the songs kind of work in symmetry mm -hmm. with like his like his film Whereas these other lesser indie movies, I don't want to name names, <laughs> but, but, but they well, just let, throw let me, these songs in. Let me leave you with this. If you're thinking about making a, a film and you want to include some, you know, some some lovely music in it, just remember it. that you got to earn it. <laughs> exactly. You got to <laughs> earn it. You can't just put a song in there and expect that's going to do the work. You got you to gotta do the work yourself and then let the song enhance the work that you already put in. Mm -hmm. um, but everybody thank you so much for listening to Lopes on Movies I hope that uh, this was a, a fun episode and I hope that you'll all watch Trolls World Tour yeah on, because that uh, destroyed mm, the movie industry can I just say like why I, I thought Wes Anderson because he's he's got another uh, you know, another movie that's supposed to come out this year called The French oh, yeah? Dispatch and uh, you know I thought it would be nice to kind of see a Wes Anderson movie after I saw the trailer it looks another like another great awesome. one but I'm just I'm just uh, wondering now, like, will this theater thing, like, yeah. prevent it from coming out? Now, it says expected, like, in October, but... Hopefully. Well, I mean, geez, go watch all of Wes Anderson's movies. He hasn't made any bad stuff. He's great. It's true. All right, everybody, have a lovely morning. We will see you next week. <laughs>